Good morning. Unintended consequences. What in the world is this? We're living in a time when we are beginning to reap what has happened in the past. There has been nothing like it in the world, to the area and the time in which we're entering. And so I'm going to be talking about um, consequences, many of which are un unintended. And some of us, I'm sure, have had experiences that way. But the world is coming to that realization also. And uh, the unintended consequences, may, they may be positive or they may be negative. They may be good or they may be bad. Um, and in Galatians 5.13, he says, You brethren have been called to liberty as an opportunity not for the flesh, but through love to serve one another. We break this down. Number one, we've been called to liberty, liberty in Christ. And I'm going to be dealing primarily with liberty of conscience. As we get into this, we're entering into the last phase of religious liberty the next, the rest of this month and early next month. I want to share how I got involved in this a number of years ago. Uh, <clears throat> there was a man in our conference, this was in uh, Pennsylvania, and he was doing a doctoral class, teaching people how to preach, and he was teaching them Greek and Hebrew, <clears throat> and I thought, I thought it was a little heavy for people in the conference. But there was one area that he was weekend, and he came to me and he said, would you, would you teach uh, some of the concepts of 1844 to 1888 dealing with uh, the history of Adventism? And I said, sure. And one of, the, one of the lectures that I gave was on the relationship between justification by faith in Christ alone and freedom of conscience. And unbeknownst to me, the conference president came in <laughs> while I was speaking, and I thought, uh-oh, might, might be in trouble here. But he called me about a week later and he asked me, he said, would you, would you uh, consider becoming the religious liberty person for the conference? And I said, well, let me pray about it and we'll see. And the Lord directed that way. Uh, and I've, I was thankful to, be get, to get into that uh, area. Uh, since I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I've always been interested in religious liberty, but also the relationship with Christ and salvation. And so that's the direction we're going to be heading toward. Uh, I want to, uh, I think we'll go to, to Luke chapter 4, and this is one of the first sermons that Jesus gave after he was baptized. He went into, into the public ministry. And in, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 61, and beginning with verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovery, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And as you recall that as Christ was speaking, hearts were warmed and they began saying, Amen, Amen. And then he says, this day this is fulfilled in your own ears. And they became furious. You remember they dragged him out of, the, out of the synagogue, took him to the edge of a hill or a cliff, was going to throw him over it. But the angels came and parted the way between the people and Christ escaped because he, he knew his time was not, uh, was not yet. And so <clears throat> this is the gospel of liberty, of freedom. The first thing that God delivers us from is the conscience so that we can serve him by choice, not by force. James 125 and, and chapter 2 says that it speaks about the, the law of liberty. God's law is one of liberty. Psalm 119, 45 says, I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. Now, we cannot go to the law itself and get it, but once we're in Christ, then that law is like a ring around us uh, uh, to uh, support us and to, uh, to keep out that which ought not to be there. Now, before we can walk at liberty, we must have on gospel shoes. 
And in Ephesians 6.15, it talks about that our feet are, should, should be prepared with the gospel of peace. And uh, I think I have an any yes, this is a good one. The New English Bible says that let the shoes on your feet be the gospel of peace to give you firm footing. We cannot keep the commandments of God unless we have on gospel shoes. We cannot follow Christ unless we have the shoes that he's prepared for us, which is the good news of salvation. And that's what we want to talk about that also today. Um, the, um, if we have not on gospel shoes, we will cause negative unintended consequences. We're going to look at, I've got several illustrations. In fact, as I was going over this, or after I got preparation, I thought I could have spent the whole uh, sermon dealing with illustrations of unintended consequences. And uh, uh, if we do not have on gospel shoes, we will likewise start into operation positive un unintended consequences. And we can see this on a personal level, but also on a national level and on a worldwide level. And we'll touch on some of that. Uh, these are consequences. They're unintended. They're, they're un we do not see them until maybe afterwards we can, we can uh, observe. But here are some of them. Uh, there, there may be some unexpected benefits, and these would be positive. Things that happen to us, maybe someone else has done, or maybe you've done something for someone else. But have you ever had the experience of where uh, you may have done something for someone, you forgot all about it, years later that person would come back to you and, and you'd say, do you remember such and such a time when you did thus and though? <laughs> no, I don't remember anything about it. But this, this would have been a uh, consequence of an action that we took that we have, not, we have no record in our, in our memory of, about it. And I think there's going to be a lot of that going on in heaven. In fact, I think I want to share uh, an experience with, uh, uh, I used to canvas, and uh, some of you have read perhaps Uncle Arthur's uh, bedtime stories or, or Bible, uh, Bible studies guides. Um, I listened to Elder Maxwell a short time before he died, and he was sharing his experience and the experience of his mother. He was from England and Scotland, and there was an evangelist that held a series of meetings. Only one person accepted the message that the evangelist was giving and was baptized, and that was his mother. And he was only about, I think, about eight years old or something like that. And after the meetings were over, that evangelist decided he'd had it. He was so discouraged, he gave up the church, he gave up God. And I'll never forget what Elder Maxwell said. He said, I want to, he said, let's picture heaven. He said, if, uh, if this man had been faithful, and, and when I was before, if I were before the throne of God, God will point to all the hundreds of thousands of people that were converted through my works. He had, I think he had at that time over a, million, uh, over a thousand books that had been sold at that time. And he said if that evangelist had been faithful, that God would have pointed him to those, all those people. He said, you're responsible for these. It was because of your sermon. You only had one person who was, was converted. But through the influence of that, these are the consequences of that sermon. And that would have been an un, unexpected uh, consequence for that man. And I'm sure we're going to run into several of those like that uh, in heaven. I want to be a part of that, don't you? <laughs> um, there are some that are, that are drawbacks. Uh, there could be a loss of a job, it could be sickness or health, whatever, or an injury. And uh, I mentioned here Tom. Tom is a fellow that I knew years ago, and just recently he called me and he said he'd had a, a, not an accident, he likes to ski, but he said problem had come to his, uh, one of his ankles from the boot rubbing on his uh, ankle and he could hardly walk. And I thought, well, here, this would be an example of, uh, of an unexpected consequence. He was going to have a good time skiing, but through time, it actually was a, a detriment to him. Uh, there can be perverse results, and this would be something that's contrary to what had been planned or intended. And I want to share something with a scientist who uh, thrust his hand in a, when an um, atomic fusion was beginning to take place. 
and I've got some pictures of it a little bit later. And so here's some of the some of the uh, examples that I thought of. Uh, there's a push today for fossil-free future. We've got frozen windmills, rolling blackouts in Texas and also in California, or there have been in California. And so many are afraid now that there's going to be a problem with, uh, with the green energy future that we're, we're faced. In, in, uh, in Texas, as you well know, that the windmills have frozen because of the, the cold weather, and many people are suffering because of this. And I'm listening to all kinds of arguments now of why it is and why it should be, and, it, and that windmills are not, uh, not the problem. Then here's another one, rabbits in Australia and New Zealand. There's a few here, look at here, here's tens of thousands, millions of them. It started out by only 12 rabbits that were shipped from England to Australia. A man by the name of Wilson was over there, and he, he had, when he was in England, he had hunted rabbits, and he enjoyed that, so he asked a relative, he said, send me 12 rabbits. And they, they sent them to him, and the rabbits, as you know, multiply very rapidly. And uh, that happened there. Within, within 10 years, there were millions of them. And uh, this was an example of unintended consequences. Rabbits had become so prevalent within 10 years of their introduction in 1859, that two million could be shot or trapped annually without having any noticeable effect on the rabbit population. This is an, this is a, an example of what we're talking about today. And uh, here is part of the problems they're having there, that as they burrow and as they, as they eat, uh, then the rains come and they have tremendous uh, erosion problems in, in Africa or in Australia. And, uh, and then you have in Guam, uh, there's a, what they call a, a brown tree snake that was accidentally, accidentally introduced to the island right after World War II. And uh, the, uh, this is a picture of one of them. Nice looking fellow, hmm? There's a close up. <laughs> what they did, they, uh, these snakes have eaten almost all, killed almost all of the birds in, uh, in Guam. I don't, think, I don't think I ever heard a, a bird sing while, while I was there. It was there two or three different times. And these are tree climbing snakes, and they get up and they eat the, uh, eat the birds. They get the birds, especially at nighttime. And um, they've caused exten ex extension of nearly every native bird species in Guam. And here's another one, this, especially in the United States. Uh, these people are sprinkling uh, DDT. This was in the 1940s. And uh, DDT was sprayed in large amounts during that time. And it was to kill, primarily to kill the mosquitoes that were carrying malaria. And uh, then you have uh, airplanes that were sprinkling this stuff on crops that farmers were, were growing. I think it was 1972 they finally passed the law not to use this stuff. But here's, a, here's one on a beach where people are being uh, drowned with this stuff. And I've seen pictures of where people were, uh, they actually sprayed it directly on them. And sometimes they would have, uh, they would have uh, uh, vehicles going down a street and you have kids running after them and they're running in the clouds of DDT that was uh, coming from the, from the trucks. Now, the, what, they, what really got to the um, people, there was a lady in the 1970s, 60s, I guess, in the 70s, they, she noticed that the bald uh, eagles were, uh, and other birds were dying off, and they weren't, being, weren't coming back. And what happened was they caused the eggshells of the birds to be thin, and they were, of course, breakable. Here's a picture of a normal egg on the right, on the left-hand side. DD exposure eggs on the other, where the the egg the egg shell was so thin that it just uh, they would they would die, and uh, and they were concerned about DD and eagles uh, eggs at that time, and the falcons also, and then this is the man that I mentioned earlier about having uh, um, the atomic energy. He was in in uh, New Mexico. He'd worked on the atomic bomb when he was uh, uh, during World War II. And he 
took part in the Manhattan Project, which was the developing of the atomic bomb. He performed experiments with uranium and plutonium. They were cores that would determine their critical mass value. And he was trying to figure out where uh, the approximate place where they could get them without it exploding. And uh, this was after the war. And a he accidentally began a fusion reaction. And it released a, a energy in the room, in the laboratory. And he thrust his hands between them to separate it. And then he talked to everyone that was there. He said, mark, mark a place where you're standing. Draw a line where you're at because people were going to want to know where you were at when this thing took place. He said, I, I cannot live, I, there's no way that I can live through this, but you may have a chance of life. But he, he uh, prevented that from, from the explosion at that time. One other man died, but uh, um, th this was an unexpected consequence of something that he did. He didn't intend it, but it did, it did happen. And, uh, he, but he did stop the the um, reaction. This is a picture that they were talking about that they have two particles on, on either side. The one in the center is where the thing was coming together and he thrust his arms or his hands in between that to, pre to prevent it from uh, uh, exploding and he died because of it. Now we're going to talk about the Protestant Reformation also unintended con consequences. Uh, so this can happen not only to people but it can happen to nations and events that take place. Uh, and it's happened in the, in the past. In, in uh, 1095, this is the year 1095, Urban II remitted all penance of persons who participated either in crusades or who confessed their sins. And uh, this finally developed into where uh, if they couldn't go on a crusade, they could give money for this. And, they, and, and again, they would be forgiven sins. This led to the selling of indulgences, which is the practice of asking payment, called indulgences for the forgiveness of sins. And this is what Luther got, uh, uh, got upset about. Uh, this began in, in 1095, but one of the unintended consequences occurred over 400 years later. And this was in 1517 when Luther packed, uh, tacked his theses on the Wittenberg church. And he was not trying to uh, do anything to the church at that time. He was, a, he was a loyal supporter of it. But what happened that he wrote when he, when he put the, the theses on the church, he was calling for scholars and other ones to discuss what was going on. But it, it exploded and it went throughout all of Europe and that began the Protestant Reformation. Um, the man who that um, Luther was concerned about was Johann Tetzel. And he used this slogan as he came in. As soon as a coin in coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and uh, people would come to Luther and say, well, God has forgiven our sins, so I don't have to confess them. They've already been, not only, the, not only past sins or present sins, but also future sins. And Luther really became riled over that. He said, this is not so. It cannot be. Now, he did not fully understand the message of salvation. About this time, or maybe a little before, he, he stated that when he read about the righteousness of God in Romans, especially chapter 1, uh, he said it, he, it, uh, he got mad at God because he said God is trying to get us to, to uh, be like him. And he knew it was impossible. But he did not understand the plan of salvation at that point in time. He did later, but um, when he was at uh, the, the Diet of Arms in 1521, he was called in because of the conflict that was going on in the church at the time. And um, when he came, what he was supposed to do was, was uh, uh, recant everything that he had said and destroy his own books. And he explained to them why he could not and uh, this is what he said. This is right, right at the end of his uh, dissertation. Luther declared himself bound in conscience by the word of God and stated, it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. And this is a principle for us in these last days. I say this, that our religious freedom can be taken from us, but our liberty of conscience cannot. We will lose our freedoms but we do not have to give way to liberty of conscience. It, the only way that it can be taken from us is if we give it up. 
And uh, there are some people that are ready to do that. You remember when 9-11 uh, took place? 9-11, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, there were Christians, hopefully no Adventists, but there were Christians who said we would give up our religious freedoms, liberty of conscience included, for protection from the centralized government. And that's the direction we're headed. Uh, people, when you're, when you're in uh, a bind, um, you think that maybe you're going to lose your life, then many will turn to the government for, prote for uh, protection. And we're seeing this develop uh, in our lifetime. But we need to remember that our consciences should not be blunted. Paul wrote about that to Timothy. He talked about the conscience being um, seared with, as with a, a, a hot rod of iron. But Luther taught, this is later on, Luther taught that liberty of conscience is the most important part of faith. This is what he said, let there be no compulsion. I have been laboring for liberty of conscience. Liberty is the very essence of faith. And that's, uh, Dauvigny was the one that uh, quoted from him. And this, uh, this has been re uh, recorded also four times, once in the size of the times of 1883, 1884, 1888, 1911. Uh, religious liberty, conscience related to faith and justification by faith was a part of the Adventist movement in the early days. And, and hopefully it'll be the same in these last days. But these two concepts were joined together uh, during the Protestant Reformation. Later by uh, Baptists and then still later Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, I remember talking to a, a man, a, a Baptist man, who was the head of uh, one of the religious departments in his denomination. And he was about to leave re in retirement. And uh, I'd already known some of our men who had gone to him especially and gotten PhDs in uh, separation of church and state. And so I asked him what, uh, what was going to happen when he left. He said, well, hopefully someone will take up this and, and uh, go with it. And I don't think it's happened. Uh, the Baptists have been backing away from liberty of conscience. In fact, it was a president of the Southern Baptist uh, Union that gave up, uh, Christi well, not Christianity, he gave up uh, his Baptist position and Protestantism and became a Catholic. And this was re took many people by surprise. But uh, I would say that if not now, we will be the only ones who will be defending liberty of conscience. And it's not just for our own benefit. Uh, if we're working with Muslims, Catholics, or Protestants, or Hindu, or whatever, um, it's part of liberty of conscience is to defend, defend their right to choose to serve God in the way they're doing. Uh, we cannot force them. And uh, there will be force, uh, Revelation 13 and, and 14, when it deals with the beast and all his marks and things of that nature, it is an issue of liberty of conscience versus the faith of Jesus in chapter 14, verse 12. And uh, that's the goal that God has set for us. Now, some Protestant economic principles. Number one is justification by faith. All of that came liberty of conscience. Then you have the Protestant worth ethic. Free markets, free trade, capitalism, organization, and this has been, uh, has been recognized by uh, people in the world. The teaching of justification by faith led to these unintended consequences. Number one, liberty of conscience. Then the priesthood of all believers, the separation of church and state, religious and civil liberties, free markets and economies, uh, economics, constitutional government. And then the first one that we see is the, the Dutch Re Republic, the northern part of of uh, Holland. Uh, it became a tremendous powerhouse uh, in that day when they accepted the, the message of justification by faith and liberty of conscience, they began to grow. And here is, uh, it's called the Golden Age, uh, in, uh, right after the Reformation, or within 100 years after the Reformation. And it was a political model for others, a radical attitude towards religion in the country with a certain level of tolerance, religious tolerance. It was a stable, thriving economy. It was called the golden age of artists and thinkers. Uh, religion and every, everyday life were recurring themes in their art. Uh, and uh, 
Here's a picture of this. You have the Spanish Netherlands on the south. I've got another one here. Uh, yeah, the purple is, is the Protestants in the north. And it was during this time that, that uh, Spain was trying to capture all of the Netherlands, but they, did not, they were not successful. The um, Dutch in uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam, the granaries had enough supply to last for a full year. They had higher sal salaries than any other part of Western Europe. Even women had higher wages. Again, the Protestant work ethic, thrift and frugality. They had the highest standard of living in Europe. And the economy was out of this world. They, they exported diamonds, linens, and pottery. Very little uh, in inflation. And they reclaimed, you know, a lot of you probably remember, as a, I think they're still teaching it in school, I don't know, where they reclaimed land that the water had come, uh, the, the ocean had been destroying, and they put their dams up there. And um, they were masters of the carrying trade. In other words, this had to do with the shipping rates worldwide. They were the greatest seafaring commerce company at the time. And the, this is uh, lines of, of where they went. And uh, this is before England uh, became the, the uh, commerce center of the world. Okay, so coming back to this. Protestant teaching of justification by faith led to these unintended consequences. People didn't realize what was happening, but God did. The Dutch Republic and then later on, the United States of America. We are based on those principles that came out of the Reformation. And, uh, but there's something happening among us today. We're actually shifting from the uh, Protestant government we're shifting to a place where every principle of the Constitution will be denied. And I've noticed that through the years, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat in these high places, almost every president that has come along has taken more power to himself. And some have been alarmed about it, but there's, there seems to be nothing that can be done about it. But anyhow, there's a shift in thinking of many Americans who don't have a background of where we came from and where we're at now and where we're going. The, um, I remember in uh, 2010, it was about 10 years ago, I remember seeing this, capitalism isn't working and another world is possible. You'd mentioned about the new world order. That's exactly what's happening. Actually, we're, we're going into socialism. There are many that want socialism. Uh, they've been taught in our universities for years and we've got a, I remember uh, doing a, uh, this, uh, something like this at a camp meeting and there was a young woman, I would say her early, early 30s, late 20s. She was angry because of what I was saying. We are talking about capitalism. I said, Cap capitalism has many faults, but it, is a, it came out of Protestantism. And she got up and she said, I thought so, and she walked out and let everybody know that she wasn't, uh, didn't approve of what I was saying. But this is the idea that uh, they believe that, that capitalism, and uh, you mentioned the Pope. The Pope hates capitalism. He's very vocal about it and he would like to see it uh, be eliminated. There, now, there was a German sociologist, soci sociologist uh, Max Weber, who wrote a book back in 1905, and he entitled The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. He argued that capital, capitalism, the history of it, emerged in Protestant countries because they instituted those virtues that led to the development of capitalism. Hard work, honesty, frugality, thrift, and punctuality. These virtues, coupled with the idea of a calling, provided the impetus to end serfdom and establishing a free political and economical order. And what we're seeing, that there are some people that want to break, uh, take us back to the Dark Ages, where you have uh, slaves and serfs on the bottom holding the whole thing up, and you have kings and queens political leaders, religious leaders on the top. And, uh, and some really w want to have that, but it's, it was not the way we were, we were established as a, as a nation. The theology and values of the Bible rediscovered by the Protestant reformers in the 16th century have been the principal movers in creating what we know as Western uh, civilization. And those who may not even be Christians, they recognize that the the principles of Protestantism in the Bible are the reason that we're here uh, today. 
and that, that uh, what Luther started especially uh, benefited the entire Western society and civilization. Now, it was not Luther's intent to create a new civilization. That was not his idea at all. He intended to proclaim the righteousness of God in Christ, and that was his goal. His life was dedicated to a far more important activity than building an earthly tabernacle or nation or city. Western civilization is an unintended consequence of his faithfulness to the Bible and to the message of salvation. And again, we're going to come back to this. An unintended consequence of justification by faith. This is a, uh, just a review of what we already said. The Protestant Reformation was such. Constitutional government, separation of church and state, religious and civil liberties, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, right to petition, habeas corpus, free market system, capitalism and economics. Uh, capitalism is the economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private people for profit rather than controlled by the state or by the church. And what's happening today is that people want to control uh, what's going on economically from, uh, from a centralized position. We are all going to be caught in this if, uh, if, we're, if we're in this time frame that we think we are when it comes to not buying or selling. Uh, we need to know Jesus Christ. That is the one area that regardless of what happens, because it's not going to be pleasant entirely for sure, but if we know Christ, he has promised to take us through these uh, times uh, that, that we're actually we're living in. Um, capitalism is the economic practice of which Protestantism is the theory. The outcome of Luther's struggle to understand justification by faith was an unintended Protestant Reformation and also consequences that dramatic impact not only Christianity but all of the Western world. And I would say not just the Western world but the whole the world itself is based on, uh, on this concept. Now the United States of America is the unintended consequence of justification by faith. Let's consider some things. The events that led to the Democratic Republic of America why did God choose America as the birthplace and cradle, and, and, uh, cradle of the Advent message? It was far distant from the union of church and state as practiced in Europe. And our forefathers said that they, they wanted a place, a country that did not have a king ruling in political affairs or a priest or a minister ruling in uh, religious affairs. And so that Constitution, or before the Constitution, we have the, the um, Declaration of Independence, 1776. Then came the Constitution, ratified in 1789, the Bill of Rights in 1791. By the way, I'm going to ask a question. When was the last time you read the De Declaration of Independence, or the, or the Constitution, or the Bill of Rights? We ought to be familiar with these concepts, because they will be taken from us. There are people today who are working to abolish these things, and uh, we need to understand. We need to read them anyhow to find out what's going on. But in 1844, the Three Angels message came into existence, and I believe that this country was set up specifically for the message to go to the world from because of the economic situation we had at that time, and uh, and I think it's still still valid today. The, uh, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights prepared the way for the Advent message, the proclamation of the everlasting gospel, Revelation 14, verse 6, and on through 12. Here we have the, the last sentence of the Declaration. And for the support of this Declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And those men who signed the, the Declaration of Independence, the, many of them lost everything they had, some of their lives. I remember reading about one man who, uh, he had a, a, a nice mansion probably, had a lot of money, and, but he was, he was for the, uh, America. And he was standing on a hillside with other colonists, and the British were about to take his, um, uh, destroy his, his home. And he stood there, he watched it, and he said, let them have it. And they, they, they did destroy it. But many of our forefathers lost everything they had because they desired freedom. 
and liberty of conscience, and that type of thing. And they pledged to each other that uh, they would give up everything in order to establish uh, this nation. Total self-sacrifice uh, for that. And then the second sentence of paragraph two at the beginning of the declaration, he says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, you know, it doesn't say happiness. It says the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. This is a, a, a republic. The republic is to be governed by the people, not from the elite in Washington. But we're seeing that uh, there's been a switch. Actually, it happened several years ago. And it's getting more and more so uh, in our day. But before the pursuit of happiness, there must be liberty. Before liberty, there must be life. Before liberty, there must be justification through Christ alone. And uh, Romans chapter 5.18 lays this out. Through one man's righteousness, one man's righteous act, which was Jesus Christ, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Then comes liberty, followed by the pursuit of happiness. Uh, Romans 5.18. These are the principles that we're dealing with uh, even in our own day. So the United States of America is an unintended consequence of justification by faith. Now, losing sight of it uh, as an unintended consequence of losing sight of this, either liberty of conscience or justification by faith, the, the experience of it, when that happens, the gains of the Reformation that we see have been slipping away from Protestantism and from America and around, the, it'll be the whole world. And we're living, we're living in a time that uh, there's no doubt that uh, some of us are going to see, see this more fully. Some of us graybeards are going to be laid to rest, maybe, before the Lord comes. But if not, we're going to have the privilege of seeing the power of God demonstrated as we've never seen in our lives. And I would say in the lives of mankind from the beginning of, uh, of, of time. Because in the last days, all... Uh, all the forces of good and all the forces of evil, the angels are going to be involved in this and we're going to be on one side or the other. I want to be on the winning side, don't you? It may not appear to be true, but it is true. Jesus Christ has never lost a battle with the devil, ever. He never will. And when our lives are hid in him, he will see us through. There's, there's no question in God's mind about it. And as we say, God, do with me what you will. Save me in spite of myself. But here are some of the losses. If, if we lose sight of evil, either justification by faith or liberty of conscience, uh, we'll lose uh, religious and civil liberties, we'll lose capitalism and economics, the free market, constitutional government, the separation of church and state. And so, coming back to Galatians 5.13, for you brethren have been, and women have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. God's people will, will be known as the early church. You remember what they said about them? See how they love one another. <laughs> they, were, they were united in the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's people will be united in the last days. Revelation 14, 12, is going, it's, it's, it's as true as the day it was written. The patience of the saints, here they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And in, in Hebrew thinking, you start with the result and uh, go back to the, the premise. And so it's through the faith of Jesus we are enabled to keep the commandments of God. We have on the gospel shoes of Christ, we're able to uh, obey God's law in love, not as legalism, but we'll obey. And that is what produces patience. On the other hand, the enemies of God's people and of God are going to force worship. That's what the, what the beast and his mark and all this is about. It's, it's a denial of liberty of conscience and consequently a, de de a denial of justification by faith. And that's why God has given us the, the message for that day. But you and I have been called to liberty, be, uh, ending as we did before. We do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. This is true liberty. It is liberty of conscience, 
We're not forced into a, a form, but we freely love God and we love our neighbor as ourself. I better stop with that. I've, well, maybe I will. This is not too long. Um, a number of years ago, I was invited to a, a um, Catholic bishops conference on religious liberty in Washington, D.C. And how it came about, there was a man who heard me speak on, on this subject that I'm talking about today, not, not uh, the same extent as what I'm doing here, but you know, even, more, even more so. But he said, would you hold a townhouse meeting in Washington, D.C., and we'll invite senators to come and listen. And I said, if you can work it out, yes. <laughs> but he couldn't work it out. Even with how he had, there was just too much mo money involved in renting a large facility. And he went to one of the uh, Catholic uh, universities and was talking to some of the heads of uh, departments. And one man who was political, in political science department, the head of it, he said, why don't you guys come to the uh, uh, to our meeting on religious liberty. And so that's how, that's how I got invited. And uh, Cardinal Dolan was the, the main speaker. Now the thing is, I tell you, I saw beautiful robes, flowing robes of, these, of the bishops as they were uh, coming in, different colors and things of this nature. And then you have, you have uh, there were four, four Adventists, a man and his wife, uh, Lincoln Steed, who was the editor of, of, uh, Li of Liberty, and, and myself. And we were sitting right next to the platform. The Dolan had to come down the steps, and he did. After he got down the steps, he saw me, and he came and pulled up a chair, and he started pumping me with questions. He, he knew everything about me before, before I knew what was going, what was going on. And then he, he got his information, got up to leave, and uh, uh, Lincoln jumped up, and he said, I, can I have an interview with you? And he said, sure. So they set that up. And this, I think this is, uh, um, let me see. Yeah, this was, he spoke of the grand principles of religious freedom and a Roman Catholic commitment to protecting this freedom for everyone. And this is what, what uh, Lincoln wrote later. He seemed to hesitate, paused, then said, there was a time when Roman Catholics held that error has no rights. The comment sparked much debate later, at which time a Catholic historian explained that indeed there had been a seismic shift for the Roman Catholic Church, and this is coming out of Vatican II. And um, Steed wrote about this. And, but to watch Cardinal Dolan speak and then pause, and you could almost see the wheels turning in his mind, and then he finally said that there was a time when we did it. But the, what really amazed us was that, that, um, that some of these men, probably the younger ones, they had no idea what had happened in the past. And so they were pumping uh, the panelists on questions about this, what happened in the past. They, they had no idea of who a heretic was. <laughs> and, uh, and some of them got filled in on that. But I was, I was impressed with the, the influence that the Church of Rome has, especially on our, uh, our, go our government and the State Department. And they were dealing primarily with religious freedom outside of the United States. But the principle, I think, still stands. And I thank God that they are using, so far, they're using their, their power to promote religious liberty in other parts of the world, especially for themselves, but we are still uh, involved in that uh, with them, and uh, we thank, thank God that we still have a, we still have a uh, uh, time frame of which we can serve God. But the, the time is coming when mind will be against mind the mind of Christ and the mind of the devil. And every person on the face of the earth is going to be in one or the other camps. When Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, are we letting it come in? Are we letting it come in? God wants to captivate our minds and lead us in a way where we, we love him more than ever before and we'll be prepared for the times that are coming. Before the, before the heat comes, the latter rain must fall, and God has been waiting. He started at one time, it's been on hold for many years, but it's coming again. The latter rain will fall, the loud cry will go forth, and I want to be a part of it. I'm sure you do too. But seek God, or I say respond to Him. God initiates and we participate. And it will take time every day to spend time with Jesus we shall see him face to face.
what a time that will be fully free, <laughs> resting in Him alone. He will cover us with His righteousness, and He'll put His righteousness within us. It's all by faith, by faith in His goodness. I want to close. I've got other material, but I'm going to stop here. Um, the, our, our closing hymn was written by a lady by the name of Charlotte Elliott. And uh, she was in England. I, I, don't, I think she was Presbyterian, but I don't remember now that. But um, she was not converted. She had two, two brothers who were preachers. And her dad was a, a devoted Christian. And uh, she had problems in her mind about, uh, about salvation. But she was fairly proud. She, she had a, a disease that came on her. I think she was about uh, age 32, and she was an invalid the rest of her life. But there was a preacher from Switzerland that knew her brothers and her dad, and he would come from time to time and visit with the family. And whenever they got to talking about her relationship with Christ, he noticed that she was awfully nervous. <laughs> and if he tried to push it a little while, she would get, actually, she'd get angry. So he'd back away, he'd come back another time, and uh, little by little, the Lord w was working on her heart. And she finally asked him, she said, how can I be saved? And he opened up, he said, you come just as you are without one plea. <laughs> and out of that, she wrote uh, that poem that became a song. And uh, it's been, uh, I, I remember singing uh, in a, a Billy Graham cr um, uh, choir at one of his meetings. And uh, that was a song that we sang at the end when he invited people to come forward. It's a powerful one. And... Um, Charlotte Elliott's brother, one of the brothers, said, said that she, or he, he and his brother, I think, had won about 1,000 people to the Lord at that time. And they said that poem has won more souls of Christ than all of our preaching. Absolutely amazing. But it's still powerful today. And as we go, as we go over it, uh, think of it. Just, if there's anyone here that has not accepted Christ, don't be afraid. God will give you true freedom. That's, that's what he wants. He wants us to be free in him. And uh, when you have a, a group of free people, there's nothing that can take it away from us. Gracious Father, we come to you in the words of this song. We come just as we are. We have no plea except the merits of Jesus Christ. You've promised to take us, to bring us through in the days ahead. I believe it. I thank you for it. We have nothing to fear for the future except the way we forget. We forget the way you've led us in the past. Be with our nation. Be with our political leaders. Pray that the principles of the Constitution might be exalted, not for the nation itself, but for your people around the world. Keep us, I pray, by your grace as you have promised. Thank you so much for Jesus. In his name.